It's the kind of question you'd expect to see on a TV quiz show. This is for the game. What is the shape of DNA? A double helix, Jimmy. You are correct. But in the early 1950s, what DNA actually looked like was a big mystery, one that fueled a frantic race to be the first to figure it out. And the Nobel Prize winning team who solved this mystery? James Watson, Francis Crick, and Morris Wilkins. But what about this woman? Rosalind Franklin was a scientist uh, in England in the 1950s. She also worked in Paris. It was so exciting. It was so exciting to read this play. To read about, oh, per, first of all, a period of history that I didn't know anything about. I knew Watson and Crick, and I knew a little bit about DNA from science class, but I didn't, I didn't know this story. I didn't know the, the gritty bits that were inside the story. Those gritty bits form the story behind the story. It's a little-known tale about scientific ambition, betrayal, and a scientist named Rosalind Franklin. It was her X-ray image, known as Photograph 51, that actually led to the discovery of the double helix. But she was never given credit for helping solve the puzzle. She died before the Nobel Prizes were handed out. Seattle actor Kirsten Potter plays Rosalind Franklin in Photograph 51, a new production at the Seattle Rep. There's a lot to this play that I think it can appeal in a lot of, to this science, to this cancer researcher I talk about. She's another female scientist, and she's like, sweet, let's, I'll go. You know, I mean, that's kind of all it took with her. Um, to other people, I, I do think it's a story about trying to be true to yourself when um, you don't really have a lot of sympathy about who you are. Rosalind Franklin was an English chemist who wore pearls in the lab while unlocking the secret of life. But it was the 1950s, and she was at King's College in London, where she had to put up with an old boys' club of scientists. Because she knows she can compete. She knows she can think. No one listens. Or, you know, I mean, Dr. Wilkins. She calls him over and over again, Dr. Wilkins. She's, she's a doctor, he's a doctor. They're, they're equals, they're partners. Yes, Miss Franklin. All right, Mr. Wilkins. No, it's Dr. Wilkins. Miss Frank, uh, Miss Franklin. Seriously? My name is Rosalind, but you may call me Miss Franklin. Everyone else does. Fine. Of course, I prefer Doctor Franklin, but that doesn't seem to be done here, does it, Mr. Wilkins? Doctor Wilkins. Doctor Wilkins. I don't joke. I take my work seriously, as I trust you do too. It was a sexist situation, you know. She was in a situation where she couldn't even go into the co the senior common room to eat lunch because she was a woman. So, you know, from a male perspective in 2013, um, you know, it's clear why she was not happy. Before directing this play, Braden Abraham didn't know anything about Rosalind Franklin. And he loves how this story gives people an insider's look at the way scientists work. The sense of collaboration, the sense of competition, the sense of um, getting to something unknown, making that discovery, I think that, that those are the parts that are really interesting. Our instruments felt like extensions of our own bodies. But the play shows us the cost of ambition, how we can be cruel in the race to be first. And it leaves us wondering, was Rosalind Franklin a victim? Playwright Anna Ziegler doesn't think so. She was not a simple character and that she, she was up against a lot of obstacles, but she also got in her own way, I think, in a, in a big way. And there's a big debate about whether she would have won the Nobel had she lived, because, you know, it's not given posthumously. Um, so people talk about this a lot. And, and I think there's, uh, a, you know, a big contingent of people who believe she would have gotten the Nobel, maybe instead of Morris Wilkins, who was, who was added on as the third person um, to get it alongside Watson and Crick. 